Hi everyone, I'm pleased to be talking to you today about my work on ESBL plasmids in Klebsiella in a hospital setting. So first, a quick bit of background about Klebsiella. So Klebsiella is a gram-negative bacteria and it's frequently an opportunistic pathogen in humans. Now, there are many different Klebsiella species, as we can see from the phylogenetic tree on the right. However, species that fall within the Klebsiella pneumoniae species complex, which are the seven species shown in the box, are the most common in humans. And species within the Klebsiella pneumoniae species complex are often multi-drug resistant when we find them in hospitals. And third generation cephalosporin resistance is becoming a real problem here in Australia. And that's usually mediated um, by the carriage of extended spectrum beta-lactamases or ESBLs in Klebsiella, which are frequently found on plasmids. So we've already done quite a bit of work looking at Klebsiella um, diversity and strain transmission in our hospital. So in 2013 to 2014, we had a one year study called CASPA. And in this study, all patients in the ICU were screened for carriage of Klebsiella. And we also collected all Klebsiella infection isolates hospital wide. Overall, we had 440 genomes that came out of the study. And these genomes were all sequenced using the Illumina platform to generate short reads. And at the time, one of the PhD students in our group, Claire Gorey, uh, worked on this data, and she spent quite a lot of time um, understanding the strain transmission dynamics, uh, which you can find in these three papers here. And so one of the main findings that Claire had was that isolates that we were pulling from the hospital called Klebsiella pneumoniae actually belonged to three different species, um, all of which are in the Klebsiella pneumoniae species complex, and these isolates were incredibly diverse. We did, however, see some instances of strain transmission, and these are the lineages or sequence types highlighted in blue. Uh, but as I said, Claire mostly focused on what was happening at a strain level in this population, and she didn't look too deeply into the plasmids. And we know that when it comes to the movement of antibiotic resistance, that strain transmission isn't the whole story. So what we really wanted to understand was what were the dynamics of ESBL transmission in our hospital? So firstly, what is the actual burden of ESBLs um, during this study period? What are the plasmids that are carrying these ESBL genes? Was there any plasmid transmission occurring? And what was the impact of any plasmid transmission on ESBL burden? And so we used a combination of Illumina and nanopore sequencing to answer this question. So we took our 440 genomes and the first thing we did is we dereplicated them so that we only had uh, one genome per episode. So that made sure we had a unique genome per patient and per body site um, to remove any duplicates. And so here uh, is a bar chart showing you the total number of episodes per month of the study broken down by whether the isolate was a carriage isolate or an infection isolate. And when we screened the Illumina data for ESBL genes, we found that 18% of our genomes had an acquired ESBL gene. And by far the most common ESBL gene was CTXM15. So then to get at what plasmids were carrying these ESBL genes, we then went and did an additional round of sequencing where we selected genomes to do nanopore sequencing on. And the way we selected genomes is we made sure that we were going to have at least one completed genome per species, sequence type and ESBL gene combination. So once we had our completed genomes, then what we wanted to do was to find similar plasmids. So the first thing we did is we um, separated our genomes out into what specific ESBL gene they carried. And then we took the plasmids that carried um, the same ESBL gene and we compared them all in a pairwise fashion. And so here I have an example of two CTXM15 plasmids. And the first comparison that we would do for each pair was to compare their nucleotide sequences. And we would then get a nucleotide similarity score, which fell between zero and one, one being identical and zero being not the same at all. And so in this um, toy example here, we can see our nucleotide sequences are pretty similar. We have a score of 0 0.98. The next thing we did is we wanted to check how similar the gene content was. So to do this, uh, for each pair of plasmids, we worked out which genes were homologous and homologous genes got the same gene symbol, which is what I'm showing here. And then we calculated out of all the possible gene symbols across these two plasmids, how many did they have in common? And that gave us our gene similarity score. And for this example here, the gene similar similarity score for these two plasmids is 0 0.8. 
And then the final thing that we did is we had a look at the order of genes. So if we took these two plasmids and we had the sequence start in the same location, how many of the genes were not just the same, but also in the same order. And so this is what I'm sort of demonstrating here. We have um, our two plasmids and the gene symbols are pretty much all in the same order, except for um, the middle is genes, gene four and gene 10. And so that was a gene alignment score. Um, and in this particular example, the gene alignment score is 0 0.88. So back to our question, how many different ESBL plasmids are there? This is what we did. We compared every plasmid pairwise. And on this graph here, I'm showing just the nucleotide similarity scores and the gene content similarity scores. Each point is a pair of plasmids um, colored by whether they come from the same strain or sequence type or not. So gray if they don't and black if they do. And you can see that there's a pretty clear break in the distribution. So in the top right hand corner, we have pairs of plasmids that are sufficiently similar at both the nucleotide and a gene content level as to be called the same. So when we applied these cutoffs, we found that we had 12 distinct Klebsiella plasmids um, across our ESBL collection. 10 of these um, had Inc. F replicons. They were generally pretty large, um, at least 100 kilobase pairs in size. And the vast majority of them carried additional AMR genes on top of the ESBL gene. So then we wanted to understand if there was any evidence of plasma transmission. So to do this, we took our scores and we used them to make a network. And what we found when we made this network is that most plasmids were in a single sequence type. So here I have an example of a CTXM15 plasmid, um, plasmid B, and each of the dots here represents a genome colored by its sequence type. And the genomes are connected by a line if they share the same plasmid. And you can see that all three of these genomes um, have the same plasmid, but they're also all the same color. So they all belong to the same sequence type. And generally, this is what we saw for many of our plasmids. They either belong to the same sequence type or they were um, just a single strain that just carried that plasmid. However, we did find one plasmid that was found in multiple Klebsiella sequence types and even multiple Klebsiella species. So this plasmid we called plasmid A, it carried a CTXM15 gene. Uh, it was pretty big at about 250 kilobase pairs. It had Inc FIB and Inc F2 replicons, and it carried five to eight additional um, AMR genes on top of the CTXM15. And you can see by the different colors here in this little network is that it's present in multiple sequence types. And in fact, the light purple dot actually represents a different um, Klebsiella species called Klebsiella varicola. So we wanted to have a look at um, what was going on with all of these different plasmid A positive um, genomes and what was happening um, with their sequence types more generally across the study period. So what we found was that plasmid A was present throughout the entire study period. And the first thing that we noticed was that uh, Klebsiella ST323, which is the top row here in this graph um, in blue, um, was carrying the plasmid throughout the entire study period. So each of these points is colored in if the genome is positive um, for plasmid A. And we can see there's ST323 all the way along. We see single instances of ST221 and 5822, uh, both of which carry um, plasmid A. And then what we see is about halfway through the study, uh, we see the emergence of ST29 that's now carrying plasmid A. So we hypothesize that ST323 has donated its plasmid to ST29. And this is our first instance of um, plasma transmission into a new strain. And then we also see a couple of instances of our Klebsiella varicola ST347 um, emerging, now carrying plasmid A. And again, we hypothesize that ST323 has donated its plasmid, and this is now our first instance of um, species transmission. So what was the impact of plasmid A transmission across the study? So here I have a bar chart showing the total number of ESBL episodes that have occurred per month um, during the study. So we had 57 ESBL episodes across the whole study period. 23% of those were due to um, ST323. However, if we then add in all of the additional ESBL episodes that were caused by strains acquiring plasmid A, we now have 53% of all of the episodes throughout the study were due to plasmid A. 
So a small number of transmission events has led to over half of all of our ESBL episodes um, during this study period. So this is our hypothesis, ST323 persists throughout the study period. We see um, occasional transfer of the plasmid into new strains. Two of those strains then go on to cause um, further outbreaks in the hospital and infect other patients. And we wanted to know if any of these newly resistant strains persisted beyond the end of our study. So we had a collection of all Klebsiella infection isolates from the same hospital that spanned from 2017 um, until 2020. So we had a look in these isolates to see if we could find plasmidae. And this is what we found. So here again, I'm showing each bar is showing the total number of ESBL episodes per month from 2017 through to 2020. And the bar is colored if um, that particular episode is carrying plasmid A. And so you can see many of the same colors that we've seen before. So the Klebsiella varicola ST347 um, is now very prevalent, especially in 2017 and early 2018. But we also see the emergence of a new strain now carrying plasmid A, ST2856, um, which then goes on to cause an outbreak, as well as a single um, ST5823 that now carries plasmid A. And if we look at the impact of plasmid A uh, in this early time point from uh, 2017 to the first portion of 2018, 64% of all of the ESBL episodes over this time were due to strains that carried plasmid A. So we also just wanted to double check that when we looked at the plasmids from this later time point, um, that they were indeed um, the same plasmid. And so here I just have a little depiction of what's on the plasmid. So um, this particular plasmid carries metal resistance as well as plenty of AMR genes um, shown in red. And here is a alignment of three of the plasmids, one from each of the main sequence types from the first part of the study in 2013. And we can see um, by the order and colour of the blocks that these plasmids are remarkably similar. There's been a small deletion here, and we've seen an inversion of this green block um, in these two representatives here. And when we expand this to have a look at representatives from all of our previous STs plus the new ones, um, we can see that the plasmid is remarkably similar. So there's almost no point mutations um, different um, between any of these plasmids. And the changes that we do see are mostly around um, insertions and deletions. So we have some small deletions here, and this, um, this one here and this new sequence type seems to have um, incorporated um, a larger new portion of DNA. So I think one of the main takeaways um, from this study was that plasma transmission was pretty rare in our hospital, um, but when it did happen, it had a really big impact on ESBL Klebsiella burden. And I think the other thing that I took away from um, doing this analysis was it really made me think about how we could go about performing these types of plasma transmission analyses going forward. Um, so, you know, I set specific thresholds uh, that made sense for my data at the time. Um, but I don't necessarily think that the thresholds that I've used um, here could be replicated and make sense um, across all um, studies in the future. And I think what it really comes down to is how we want to define the same versus different when it comes to plasmids. And I think one of the really key um, tricky things uh, that plasmids uh, cause when we're trying to understand this is um, having trying to have a better understanding of how frequently mutational events occur in plasmids so when we look at chromosomes uh, and we look at point mutations for many bacterial species now we have a pretty good understanding of how frequently we expect those point mutations to arise whether i don't think we necessarily have um, that good of an understanding of how often we expect to see that in plasmids you know how many point mutations between a pair of plasmids um, is enough to say this was a recent transmission event versus this happened a long time ago. And on top of that, in plasmids, we don't just have to worry about point mutations, we also have to worry about larger scale insertion and deletion events, especially in these AMR regions. You know, how often do these larger scale insertion, deletion, inversion events actually occur? And I have a sneaking suspicion that this is probably going to vary a little bit by plasma type and also potentially by host background. And I think we really need to get a good understanding um, of how frequent these different events are if we really want to be able to uh, use these kinds of genomic um, techniques to understand when we've got plasma transmission happening um, in a clinical setting. 
And finally, I'd just like to thank everyone that was involved uh, in this work. Uh, so I'd especially like to thank Kat Holt, who was my supervisor at the time that I did this, uh, and everyone in the Holt group. I'd also like to thank everyone in the hospital microbiology lab, especially Adam Jenny. Um, they collected all of the isolates and made them available for me to study. You can read some more about this work in the preprint that I'm linking below. And lastly, I'd just like to say that I'm really keen to hear um, any of your thoughts or if you've got any questions about what I've presented here today. Uh, unfortunately, it's the middle of the night here in Melbourne. Um, so this talk is pre-recorded, uh, but I'm hoping to be awake and available um, for questions during the discussion portion of this session. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you can contact me on Twitter um, or you can send me an email. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jane. That was a fantastic uh, talk. Um, and I'm glad you're still awake. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you Jana's one. I'm going to just give you one because of time, um, but we'll come back to the other stuff. Uh, from Jana Huseman. Jana, I'm going to have to ask you how to spell your, pronounce your name because I keep, I keep uh, relaying your questions. But anyway, Jane, you mentioned two episodes of plasmid A transmission into a new ST. In one case, in green, you first find the ST without the plasmid and later with. But for Klebsiella, uh, Klebsiella varicola, you don't have a null status of the strain without the plasmid. What made you think this was a new transmission event during the timing of your study? Uh, yeah, this is a really good question. Look, it's just a hypothesis. It's really hard for us to pin down um, exactly when the transmission events happened. Um, we it's not published unfortunately this information but we do know that st323 had been circulating in melbourne for a while not just in our hospital but also in other hospitals um so we we do still think that st323 uh, is the donor strain whether that plasma transmission event happened in our hospital or in another hospital in melbourne we don't know the answer to that but it's our best guess great thank you yeah yeah any follow-up on that um, I'll let you type. Um, I, um, Jane, that was brilliant. I have questions which I'll save for later. Um, and uh, I don't know how much of the rest of the session you intend on staying up for. Um, yeah, but... I'm hoping to stay for the um, discussion section um, after the following talk. Okay, and then case, go to bed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, Thanks. so let's move on to the next talk um, uh, from Rob Moran. Um, this is high resolution sequence annotation and comparative analyses as the foundations for plasmid surveillance. Uh, Rob, do we have you online? Hey, yeah, here I am. Uh, let's see if I can screen share.